the church to rise up out of the ashes and be that mighty army that God's intended for us to be for sure. Amen. Call out to those dry bones. Prophesy to the wind is what he told Ezekiel. And we've got to begin to do that through prayer. And that's what prayer is, us prophesying to the wind. We don't command the Spirit what to do, but we uh, be able to know that what the wind is intended to do is to blow. So let's pray that prayer of faith. Our children, our teens can be dismissed at this time. If you have a missions offering, you can bring that and put, place it in the plate as well. Um, I posted on Facebook, but the winter edition of Brother Hank's Devotion is out. Several have already said uh, that they want one. Uh, we've got a shipment coming. I reached out to Brother Hanks yesterday, told him to send us 2025. So see Sister Amy Wyatt if you want to get one of those. She'll get you down, and we'll get them to you as soon as we get them here. So uh, they'll be here hopefully in a week or so. Turn with me tonight to the book of James, chapter number 1. Book of James, chapter number 1. If anybody needs a Kleenex, i got about four boxes up here for some reason. James, chapter 1, we're going to begin reading in verse number 5. We're going to talk tonight as we continue our series on prayer. Now we've got... A few more weeks, we should be finishing this up before camp meeting, even with us being at 103rd for the tent revival the week before. But um, tonight might be a little lengthy, but we're going to finish them up before camp meeting. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 5, we're going to talk about an unwavering spirit. And that unwavering spirit is in prayer. Reread here, if any of you lack wisdom... Let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally and unbraided, not. And it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Maybe you want to catch up on this prayer series. There's four uh, lessons, messages before this. You can find those. Uh, I believe there's videos of all of them on our Facebook. Um, from here forward, we won't be videoing Wednesday night. We're just going to be videoing Sunday morning because it's so much to compile to get it out there. But it's also on the Spreaker app. So if you'd like to catch up, we have it on Spreaker, and if you have Spotify app, I don't know if anybody has that. I love my Spotify app. Uh, we, we have our broadcast on Spotify as well, and both of those are Wednesday night taps. You can catch up on there. You can listen while riding down the road anywhere you have your phone at. You can listen and catch up on those. But we're in Lesson 5, Message 5 of this series, Unwavering Spirit. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for your word, and we pray to find good place in our hearts tonight. Anoint us to preach real good and anoint us to receive it well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. To backslide, we've talked a lot about backsliding over the last several weeks, and what that is is really, in essence, the bottom line of it is to lose your vision. Not a vision of what we're supposed to do, but the vision of God himself. So a person backslides when they've lost their vision of God and getting their eyes off of God. Well, that was one of the titles 
uh, over the last few weeks is seeing God and knowing God. And when we do that, it delivers us from all fear. I, I reposted this on social media today because it was so good and said one reason why I, I am not concerned and number one reason why I'm not frustrated or however it was worded, not stressed or however it was worded is number one, God. And there is no number two. He is everything. So when we know God, when we see God, He delivers us from those things. So if we were keep our relationship right with God, that in every situation, you and I can honestly say that Jesus is with me and we have no reason to fear. There's a rock, as I preach Sunday, a rock in our hard place. And that rock is Christ Jesus. When we know that, man, it makes things so much easier. Well, he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you in Hebrews 13 and 5. But in backsliding, it's not that God leaves us. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So people say, well, you can't backslide because God said, I'll never leave you or I'll never forsake you. Uh, but you have you lose vision of God when you pull away from God, when you walk away from God, when you leave Him. So we begin to do that, see that process of getting back. Now that process of getting back is not always easy, but understand something, we can get back. So this is what God said, nothing shall be impossible unto you. So the fact that He said that implies that no such uncertain terms that you are are going to meet some situations in the spiritual life that look absolutely impossible. And for God to say, with, no, with you nothing shall be impossible, that tells us something. You're going to face some seemingly impossible situations. Have you ever faced any? I've faced one or six. But we've been through a few. And so we see here to, to see that nothing shall be impossible, and it looks totally and absolutely impossible. But you ever heard this saying, looks are deceiving? So it may look impossible, but that's deceiving. The devil wants to, he is the great deceiver. He is the one that wants you to believe this is impossible. But we cannot forget, uh, with God, nothing's impossible. But God looked at us and said, I give this power to you, so with you, uh, nothing is impossible. So if you've not lost your vision of God, if you uh, see God and you know God and you've got that right relationship with God and, uh, and you've got that prayer life and you're in accord with God's will and you're in harmony with Him, there is no impossibility. There's no mountain that you can't get over. There's no wall that you can't bust through. You can do all things through Christ. But you know, that's going to require something. Looks are deceiving. Nothing shall be impossible unto you that walk with God. But listen, that's going to require something. And we talked about this Sunday night. It's going to require a commitment. It's going to require dedication. Uh, it's going to require perseverance. Uh, it's going to require some fervency. Uh, it's going to require some, uh, as Hebrews said, uh, Hebrews 11 and 6, as we've read it many times, uh, he said there to knowing uh, that who he is, but also knowing that he's a rewarder of them. And that word, uh, diligently, those that are dedicated, those that are submitted, uh, it's going to take some dedication. Uh, it's going to take some determination. And that determination must say, I am not going to turn loose until I have the victory. Jacob said, I will not let go until you bless me. I will not let go until you bless me. The woman with the issue of blood, 12 long years, but she said, if I could but touch the hem of his garment, I know I will be made whole. So nothing less than touching his garment would do. It seemed impossible, but she pressed. Why? Because she said, I am not going to stop until I touch him. I'm not going to stop until victory comes. Just like Jacob, just like the woman with the issue of blood. Uh, just like so many throughout the Word of God, uh, we must have that dedication and that determination that says, I'm not going to turn loose until I have the victory. The ability to hold on, that's what we've got to have. The ability to hold on. One man said it this way, stickability. I don't even know if that's a word, but we've got to have that willingness and that ability to just stick in there. Stay in there. That ability to hold on is that inner commitment that we talked about Sunday night. That commitment to the war. To be able to go into that war through prayer 
is characterized by those of the Bible who said this in Matthew 11 and 12, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. My best friend was bragging on his wife on social media last night. I saw it this morning. And he's, he's not big into sports unless it's a rodeo. But he was talking about throwing in the towel. And he said, because this woman's been on my side, I've not thrown in the towel. I said, I know you don't know much about sports, so I want to enlighten you. The boxer and the fighter does never, never throws in the towel. It's the one that's sitting in the, on the outside of the ring, the trainer, the one that's in their corner that throws in the towel. So what we've seen here is that she has stood there with that towel possibly in her hand and watched you get your eyes beat in and watched you uh, uh, get beat up and beat down over these last few years. Uh, and with her with tears in her eyes and her heart breaking, uh, thinking I may need to go ahead and throw in the towel for him before he gets his brains beat out, uh, before the death devil uh, just destroys him, uh, but yet she didn't throw in that towel. Why does she not throw in that towel? Because she knew uh, that she was in your corner, and she knew that God was in your corner, uh, and she knew that you had a commitment uh, to fight through this thing. Uh, and so when we have people in our corner, uh, that's a good thing. People in our corner, we need to give them a reason uh, to stay in our corner, to let them see, uh, don't throw in that towel. Uh, I, I'm a big Rocky fan, and I remember uh, watching that where uh, 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 Paul Apollo Creed told Rocky, whatever you do, don't throw in that towel. He said, I don't care what happens in this fight. Uh, don't throw in the towel. Uh, and so we may have looked at them and said, don't throw in the towel. Uh, Rocky should have thrown in the towel because the Russian killed him, knocked him out uh, and killed him. Uh, but there's those that refuse spiritually to throw in the towel. Why? Because they know that some way, uh, somehow, uh, that not like the Russian with, uh, with Apollo, uh, but we're not going to be knocked out by the enemy because we have a force greater than us. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. It's not flesh and blood. I'm comparing this to a boxing match, but this is a match that we're going to fight throughout our lives to the enemy. Brother Douglas used to make it very clear. He said, I've had a bloody nose and black eyes where the devil's kicked me in the teeth. How many has heard Brother Douglas say that about 150 times? He would say it and say it and say it. Why? Because that's a reality enemy gets in his blows. Oh, but thank God that we keep fighting. We say just because it may seem like he's winning. I know that the power punch is coming. I know that I can do that. And where does that power come from? That power comes through the ability to pray through. And until once more that we realize that it's not me that's fighting. It's God fighting through me. Until I realize I may not have the physical strength, the mental strength. I may not have the emotional strength, but I know that there is a power that will begin to rise up in me as a child and the warrior and the fighter of God when God is on my side. But the only way that that's going to happen is I have an unwavering spirit of prayer till I see God is there. Every revival in history came out of a prayer meeting. It came when someone got caught up and got a new vision of Jesus. Revival has been lost in the minds of men when they became locked in in their present beliefs, and God is no longer a progressive revelation. But revival comes through people whose thinking is not hindered. Their, their mind is not pulled over here and pulled over there, and they're not blown with every wind of doctrine. Their heart is fixed. We find in Nehemiah that they rebuilt the wall, and it tells us why they rebuilt the wall. It's because they had a mind to work. We've got to have a mind that's fixed upon God. We have to have a mind that's fixed on the Word of God, a mind that's fixed on prayer and not allowing ourselves to be hindered whatsoever. The most difficult thing for any person to do is to think outside of their environment. All we can see is what is, it, what is our environment. What does that mean? What we've been taught, what we have learned, what we know. It's very difficult for us to see outside of that. What does that mean? It means it's difficult for a Baptist to think anything outside of being Baptist. 
It's hard for a Roman Catholic to think of anything outside of Roman Catholicism. And it's difficult for Pentecostals to think beyond the barriers that have been set by our particular church or organization. Uh, we can't seem to go beyond uh, that, uh, that environment that we're in. Uh, but revivals always come through people that can break out of their religious molds. Uh, when God was ready to bring about Reformation, uh, he caught the attention of a monk named Martin Luther. Uh, and so for this uh, perusal here, of those epistles of Paul, God found a mind that could think independently of Roman Catholic dogma. So when he found that mind, revival came. God's looking for a mind. God is looking for somebody that will look outside of religion, doctrine, dogma, and think, well, the Pentecostal, that's all there is. All that I've ever been, the environment that I'm in, that's all there is to it. God's looking for a mind and a heart that will say, let me find more. That's how Pentecost began. That's how the church of God began. Some Methodist boys said there's more to it than this. Could it be that there's more to it than the church of God? Could it be that God has so much more than what we think and what we've seen? Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. But some way we think God's poured everything into our little environment, and that's all that God holds. Oh, God's got so much more. He said, I want to extend your boundaries. I, I want to take you beyond where you're at. And when we begin to look beyond where we're at, we can see that there is power and potential there for God to do great things. And according to our text, the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now, you've probably met people who can never make a decision. They're always uncertain of things in their life. But can I tell you something? Indecision and uncertainty are always linked with failure. We don't care. It don't matter what you're doing. If you've been working it as a housewife or working on a job or running a business or really doing business with God, it doesn't matter. Indecision and uncertainty are always linked with failure. If you're indecisive and your commitment all of these messages tie in together. This ties right in. It's like a puzzle piece just connecting in with Sunday night. We talked about commitment. And if you're indecisive of making a commitment, then you're in trouble. You're bound for failure when God has dealt with you on being committed and you're indecisive of that and you're wishy-washy in that and you're unstable in that and you're saying, well, I would commit, but I really want to do this. I would uh, commit, but this is, uh, seems to have some importance, some bear. I need to work this out. Uh, and can I tell you, that leads to failure. We see here tonight that we can, we're going to look as we get into this and understand something about this unwavering spirit. Uh, there's some things that have to be solidified in our minds uh, if we're going to go further with God. We've got to have a made-up mind. It's got to be made up in our mind. Because if it's not made up in our mind today, then tomorrow we're going to decide something else. And then next week, somebody's going to convince us of something else. I always forget you're sitting over there. I'm preaching to you too. He's way over there by himself. He don't want to get Rona. But there's this indecisiveness that people go through. And so we have to understand something. A builder, a carpenter, they've got to understand that there are certain principles that cannot be violated if they're going to build a house that will stand. They, they cannot build it any way they want to, but they have to go by the blueprint, go by the plan. They have to look at where the foundation is going in, and they have to follow all the instructions of that. And for that same reason, there can be no indecision or uncertainty on our part when it comes to seeking God. We can't be indecisive for that, with that. We can't say, well, I don't really like seeking God today, maybe tomorrow. It has to be a daily commitment. He says, you're found when you seek me with all of your heart. He said, it, ask. Uh, have you ever noticed in Matthew 7, 7, and 8, it says, ask and it shall be, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. When you take the first three letters of those three, it's ask. When you just ask. He said, you have not because you ask not. 
And so, so that's got to be a, a daily. As we said last week, too many will tell you, well, if you prayed for it more than one time, you're doubting. Scripture says uh, that you keep seeking until you find it. Uh, keep holding on until victory comes. Uh, keep calling upon the name of the Lord until breakthrough comes your way. Uh, so understand something, uh, that we've got to keep on seeking God. When Elijah came to the scene, uh, there was a mixture there of Baal and Judaism. After three years of drought, Israel's brought to their knees, uh, and the man of God shows up. And on Mount Carmel, we find him there. He challenges the princes, uh, the, pr- the priests, and the prophets of Baal uh, with these words in 1 Kings 18 and 24. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. The God that answers by fire, let him be God. He's still the God that answers by fire. And that's still the only God there is, same as it was in his day. The prophet was saying this, quit uh, facilitating and make up your mind. Quit going back and forth between Baal uh, and Jehovah. Quit going back and forth uh, between these, uh, that some priest of, of Baal's uh, and one of Baal's prophets have come knocking on your door and tried to offer you something. I don't care who comes knocking on your door uh, and tries to tell you of another way. You've got to make up in your mind. I've just told them when they knock on my door, you're wasting your time. I've already got a made-up mind. I've already made up my mind, and my mind's not made up that I want to live in the world and be like the world, but I've already made up my mind that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I've already made up my mind. I believe in being saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't believe that Jesus was just a good prophet. I believe he's the great I am. I believe he's the rock in my hard place. I believe in speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. I came too late to convince me otherwise. So if you've come Come by my house for that reason. You've come by for the wrong reason. I believe in the rapture. I, I, I believe that we're going to be called out of here. I, I believe that there's a calling away. Uh, so when they come and they begin to do that, uh, and we begin to listen to them and entertain them because we don't want to hurt their feelings uh, because they're so diligent and so fervent in it, we're going to find ourselves in trouble. But we just. Uh, but the only way, the only way that he was able to overcome there is he just made up his mind. If God is God, then serve God. If God is God, then serve him. He said, if Baal's God, follow Baal. You can't have both of them. So if God is God, serve God, live for God, commit to God, sell out to God, make uh, church and make this a lifestyle, make it not just somewhere you show up a couple times a week or every now and then, uh, but let God be God. Uh, Let him, if he's the great I am, uh, let him be the great I am. Uh, I don't care if uh, Joel Osteen says that I am means that I am great and I am this. Uh, That's not who I am is. There's only one I am, and I am not him. Uh, I serve the great I am. I I am all of these things uh, might get you so far uh, but if you're ugly you're ugly Uh, if you're fat you're fat you're skinny you're skinny Uh, you can talk it all you want to Uh, you can't talk yourself skinny if you're fat you can't talk yourself fat if you're skinny Uh, you can't talk yourself pretty if you're ugly uh, and you can't talk yourself ugly if you're pretty Uh, there's just certain things that stay in place Uh, if I've got a size 10 foot uh, I can stand here and say I'm a size 12 I'm a size 12 uh, I'm a size 12 guess what I'm still a size 10 but understand there is only one that is the great I am there's only one that stands upon that authority and that's Christ Jesus and Moses went and didn't say well Jamie Wyatt sent me to you no he said I am has sent me unto you so if God is the great I am serve him but if you think you're God and you think you've got it figured out serve yourself If you think the devil uh, has it all under control anyway, serve him. That's all Elijah was saying. He said the only way that we're going to overcome this junk is get a made-up mind. In his day, there was too much wishy-washiness. Today, there's too much wishy-washiness. They said, no, 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 I I believe in God. Well, even the devils believe and tremble. But understand something. If you believe in God, serve him. Commit to him. Seek him. Pray to him daily. Lean on him. Depend on him. Uh, Make sure that you know that you're unwavering in that spirit of prayer. uh, Unwavering in your commitment to God. Uh, And that's what we're talking about tonight. You cannot serve God in the world. You can't. 
You, I, I said this Sunday, and I'll repeat it again tonight. Uh, Brother Clinton Dennis says this, if you want to go to hell, you can go to hell. If you want to go to heaven, you can go to heaven. But you can't go to both. You can't go to both. We're, we're not going to end up in two different places. And I hate to burst somebody's bubble. There's no in-between place. There's one or the other. Heaven or hell. Heaven or hell. And so we've got to get a made-up mind. I want to go to heaven. And if you make up your mind you want to go to heaven, uh, then you set the course. You walk with God. If I say I want to go to Jacksonville, I don't go that way when I turn out the driveway, right? That's not going to, that might get me to Jacksonville, but I'm going to have to make a turn somewhere, somewhere to go in the opposite direction. So if you want to go north, you, you don't turn south. So set your direction. Set the course. Walk with God. Get your heart fixed. And don't let nothing deter you. When you make up your mind, I'm going somewhere, you don't let anything step in your way and stand in your way. Stumbling blocks become stepping stones when you've got a made-up mind. You, you just... One man said this, said, and when, when we get a made-up mind to serve God, you're either going to get out of my way or become a part of the road because we're coming through. And so we have to let the devil know that. Uh, my pastor at Lane Avenue when I was a youth pastor used to say it all the time. Brother Steve DeBose all, said all the time, look out, devil, the church is coming through. Uh, and, and we need to be a part of that church that's coming through uh, and tell the devil you can get out of the way or get ran over. Uh, but I have got a made-up mind. The next morning, uh, about uh, as they, the shout was not there, uh, and they're all alone. So we find that that was happening uh, with Elijah. But understand that that's the message of God. People come to church the same way they come to be healed uh, and they're prayed for uh, and in the service the shout is high the message is real uh, and they believe that they're healed uh, but then the next morning the sun comes up uh, and the shout's not there uh, there's not the, the, the spirit's not high as it was in the church uh, and they're all alone and then the devil comes in and says you didn't get a healing and he begins to assail them and then they're not sure whether they're healed or not you know what's going to happen with such a person? They're never going to get anything from God. They're never going to get anything from God. Because as long as the shout's high and as long as it's being proclaimed and, and they, they lift their hands in a prayer line. I've seen too many people lift their hands in a prayer line and I've asked them, do you feel that pain? No, that pain's gone. Uh, did, did God heal you? Yes, God healed me. Uh, and then a day or a week or a month later, they come back saying, well, I guess God didn't heal me. The pain was back because they let the devil come in and convince them that they were not healed. Uh, and, and so you have to claim that healing. You have to proclaim uh, and, and stand upon that victory of that and say, well, it's not, well, I'm not sure if God healed me or not. If God healed you, he healed you. If God touched you, he touched you. And you know it was the hand of the Lord. Uh, and you can't let the devil talk you out of that. You can't let your body talk you out of it. you got to walk in faith believing. We cannot be governed by circumstances. Let me say that again. We cannot be governed by circumstances. Whether you're up, whether you're down, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, cold, or hot, you've got to be governed entirely by what God says. Circumstances are going to change, but God never does. God is that constant, constant. Has circumstances changed in your life here lately? They change. Seasons change. Circumstances change, but God never changes. And so when we're anchored in the rock, Circumstances don't matter much because they can only take us so far because that anchor is set firm. One songwriter said, Lo, let the storm clouds rise. Or let the dark clouds rise, let the storm clouds. However it goes, let the storms rise. They will not worry me. Why? Because I'm anchored. I'm anchored in him. When you've got your foot on the rock and your mind's made up, you understand that those circumstances change. Paul was there and could sing and shout at Philipp in, in Philippi. Where was he dead? He was locked in jail. He said he could shout there just as well as he could in Jerusalem. And you know what Jerusalem is? Central place of worship. Paul said in one place, I've learned whatever state I am there with to be content. But he also learned in whatever state he was to worship. You can worship God in the midst of the darkest hour of your life. 
just as well as you can in the middle of a church service. I learned that when I was 10 years old at the Marietta Church of God sitting on my dad's lap while right here in front of the church, my stepmom sitting beside him, my dad sitting here, me sitting on his lap, and my mom sitting there beside me uh, and in a casket there in the front of that church was my six-year-old sister. And I learned a lesson right then that you can worship God in the darkest hours of your life. Because I'd never seen the sight in all my life. My stepmom's hands went up into her, her baby that I know she loved so much laying in that casket. But her hands are up in the air. Her speaking in tongues. You know what that was? That was the comfort of the Holy Ghost. The comfort of the Holy Ghost. But I also watched her several years later slip into deep depression looking out the window, missing that baby so much. Circumstances. Uh, the devil tried, couldn't overwhelm her then. Tried to overwhelm her many years later. and Tried to, to get a grip on that mind. Uh, but I also watched as she began to worship God through those dark moments of her life. And I also watched as, as the, the enemy's vice had to be released and God brought peace and strength and help in those times. Uh, you've got to make up your mind uh, that I'm not going to be governed by circumstances. Uh, Paul just went ahead and worship and that was his testimony I've learned uh, wh how wherever I'm at uh, whatever state I am to be content he was content with Jesus you've got to be content with Jesus uh, he's got to be your everything uh, he's the rock in your hard place uh, he didn't have things he didn't have to be rich he didn't have to have somebody telling him how great he was uh, Jesus was everything uh, a man called Jesus uh, had impressed upon his heart and his life uh, and he it did that it wasn't cessationalism uh, it wasn't a emotions. Uh, it wasn't somebody telling him uh, uh, of some great promotion, of some great thing. Uh, uh, too many people are, uh, what is God, well, they're, they're like Janet Jackson with God. What have you done for me lately? They want to know what, how God can bless them today. He's everything that I need. He's all that I need. That's not just a song, a worship song. That has got to become our life. Understand, it's not about accolades or applause. Uh, oh, I love, I love being a preacher of the gospel. I love uh, my calling. I love uh, being a pastor. I love missions work. I love uh, evangelizing. Uh, but can I tell you, I love Jesus just as much on that back pew with my hands in the air uh, as I do up here preaching to you. Uh, I love him just as much if I'm on the receiving end. Uh, why? Because he's my everything. Uh, it's not my calling. Uh, it's everything to me but it's my Jesus it's everything to me he said that he constrains me oh and I'm thankful that that constraint upon me that what he pressed upon this heart was preach my gospel he may have pressed upon your heart teach that class he may have pressed, pressed upon your heart and constrained you sing for all that you got he may have constrained you in some area but what he's constrained on every child of God's heart is what Worship me, surrender to me, uh, submit to my will and my way, uh, and see what I'll do for your life. Here's Paul locked in the jail. His arms are in stocks. His back, sweat is filling where him and Silas had got those stripes. Paul looked at Silas and said, You know what, Silas? I think it's a good time. What do you mean, Paul, it's a good time? Let's praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. What do you mean, let's praise the Lord? He said, let's sing something. They begin to sing and give praise to God. What do you have to sing about? I don't have nothing to sing about. Physically, circumstances says I have no song. But there's a song in my heart now. For I'm living for Jesus. So when he is in our heart and he's in our life, in the midst of the worst circumstances of our life. I, I've been there in some of the hardest places when that song of, from Jason Crabb just began to come out of my mouth. He never promised that the cross would get heavy and the hill would not be hard to climb. But understand something, he'll bring us through every fire, every situation. And so he said, let's praise God. And that kind of spirit, you know what that kind of spirit's going to do? It's going to win every time. Praise wins every time.
That's the kind of spirit that holds on in spite of circumstances. That's the kind of spirit that would no matter what anybody says and what it looks like, it holds on. It believes until the answer comes and says, as it did to Daniel, Daniel, beloved of God, you were heard the first day. The spirit must never waver. Don't waver. Don't let circumstances cause you to waver. The spirit must never waver. Our prayer life must never waver. A giant in the way don't worry about it. We cannot turn our plow because there's a giant in the way. I belong to God. If there's a giant in your way, set your plow and plow through the giant. If there's a giant in your way, get out your slingshot and reach into that bag of five smooth stones that you picked up. You're only going to need one of them and the giant will soon be out of the way. Just keep going. Just keep pressing on. Quit marking time. If God is God, serve him. If Baal is God, then go with him. But quit trying to serve both. Every word in the Bible of God, and understand something, every word in that Bible is the word of God. No circumstances can alter his word. There's a story that we find in the book of Kings. God sends a young prophet to prophesy against the altar of Jeroboam. There was a division between Israel and Judah at the time, and Jeroboam was king over Israel, and he didn't want his people going down to that great altar in Jerusalem. This has always been a very interesting story to me. He builds, so he builds this altar in Judah where the people could worship, but it was wrong, the wrong thing to do. The great altar of God was in its right place, but Jeroboam had set up his own private worship. And God sends this young prophet to curse the false altar. And God gave this message to the young prophet. Go, go in, give your prophecy, and leave. Pretty simple. Go in, prophesy, say what I said, say, nothing more, nothing less, and leave. So here he goes. Don't eat nothing, don't drink nothing. Don't confer with any man. Just do what I told you to do. He comes to the altar, prophesies against it. Jeroboam the king reached out to come against him. When he reached out, his hand was withered. The king asked the prophet to pray for God to heal him. Prophet prayed, and God restored the arm. King was grateful and offered the young man great rewards if he would just come to his house. But here's what the young prophet said to the king. If you were to offer me half of your kingdom, I could not come. Understand something. He was doing good. He was following the will of God. Riches could not induce the prophet to disobey. Nothing the king offered could make him detour from what God had told him. He could not be bought. The young prophet was doing good, wasn't he? He was doing well, but hang on. As Paul Harvey says, here's the rest of the story. Two young men had witnessed this scene, and they went and told their father, and lo and behold, he was a backslid prophet. He was a backslid prophet. And what transpired, he told, they told him everything that had transpired there at the altar of Jeroboam. Here comes the old prophet. He saddled up his mule, called up with a young man, and invited him to his house. The young man, he refused, telling the old man God's instructions were not to eat nor drink or to go home with anyone. But the old man said to the young prophet, an angel appeared to me and changed the orders. You can read it. It's there in your word. He said for you to come to my house. That's the devil's big trick. It's to feign the supernatural. The devil's a deceiver, a counterfeiter. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter in. But not everyone who says they're a prophet's a prophet. They may have been at one time, but there is such thing as backsliding. Anything that will deter you away from what God said. What did God say? God said, go in, give your prophecy, leave, don't eat or drink, and don't confer with any man, don't, eat, don't go to his house. And, and he was doing good. But here's this elder prophet, and he begins to tell him, Understand something. There's very few that could withstand this pressure in defense of this young prophet. He's being told by this, this elder prophet, 
The angel appeared to me and changed the orders. You've got to know what God said. You've got to have your mind set upon his will. The young man gave in. The young prophet gave in. And you know what happened to him? He lost his life. Why did he lose his life? He, he, he lost his life because he believed this old prophet who told him. He, 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 he's standing before God, I can imagine. He told me an angel spoke to him. Well, what did I tell you? I mean, and, and people can't grasp that. But he violated the work of God. You cannot violate the Word of God. He wavered in his conviction because of what somebody else had to say and say, well, I don't know about all that, but an angel appeared to me. Listen, Paul wrote this. He said, or an, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed in Galatians 1 and 8. It doesn't matter what an old backslid prophet has to say. It doesn't matter. Paul said, and even if an angel shows up from heaven, well, there's an angel that came from heaven named Lucifer. And he'd come to you every day and tell you that the plans have changed, but it has not changed. And so we need to know where we got our orders, who we heard from. Can I tell you, as a young preacher, I've had some old preachers try to tell me that the plan was different than what God told me. And I've just looked back at them and told them the same thing I've told you many times. Anything with more than one head is a freak. I know what God called me to do. God called me to be the pastor of this church. I had a man one time who was not a preacher. He was an elder in the church, and he wanted to tell me how to pastor the church. I said, with all due respect, God called me to pastor this church. I can call the overseer tomorrow and see if he can get you a church if you want one to pastor. But you're not pastoring this church. I know what God told me. It's not what the overseer, the evangelism director, the regional pastor told me to do. The district pastor told me to do. How much time have you spent in the prayer calls and praying about the position of pastor? When you have prayed about the position of pastor, then you can make the decisions. I've heard from God, and God didn't tell me this will be my plan until the old guy in the back tells you different. That's not the way it goes. This will be my plan until some backslid preacher who is bitter and discontent uh, and jealous that God's doing more uh, in your ministry in life than he ever did uh, in his ministry in life uh, and he's wanting to detour you uh, to make him feel better. Uh, that's not what he said. Uh, God said say this uh, and get out of there. Uh, and so we've got to do what God said uh, and don't be deterred uh, by anything. Unwavering. Where there's no vision, the people perish. Can I tell you, I didn't come to the Middleburg Church of God seven and a half years ago without a vision. No, no. I walked in the door with a vision. I walked in the door, not with my vision, not with desires and dreams and ambitions like some businessman starting a new business. Brother Douglas dropped those keys in my hand. That wasn't one business owner dropping the keys in the hand of another business owner. That was one pastor dropping the keys in the hand of another pastor. That was Elijah passing the mantle to Elisha. That was the mantle being passed, the baton being passed. And why was he able to do that with confidence? Because he knew the same thing that I knew. He knew this man has a vision for this church. And I can guarantee you, I have a vision. I have a dream. I, have, I know what God said. And I, when I set a theme each year, I don't do it just to be trendy. But I believe it every year. And if I I've ever believed it uh, more than any other time. I believe that God said 2020 uh, is the year uh, of restoration. Uh, so I'm not going to let somebody come by and say, well, I think you might have missed that theme uh, because there's not much restoration going on in my life. Uh, can I tell you, uh, when God said it, it does not matter what anybody else uh, has to say about it. You may have never had it happen in your life, but no circumstance, no thing, uh, no person, uh, not even 
even an angel from heaven uh, that can alter the eternal word of God. James said, let him ask in faith, uh, nothing uh, wavering. Uh, I've heard from God, uh, and when I've heard from God, I can't waver from that. Uh, It don't matter what he said, she said, they said, uh, we must stay the course. If we're going to be victorious, if I'm going to receive from God, there are some things that I must know. We're going to face some things in this end time worse than sickness. I know, I know, we're in a time of sickness, super flu, whatever you want to call it, COVID-19, coronavirus, but we're facing something worse than that. We're losing our identity, church. We're losing our identity. And I, I don't have time to go into all of that, but as we draw near to the coming of the Lord, there's going to be all kinds of spirits that are going to come up out of hell and begin to come against us. Everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken. Everything that can be knocked out is going to be knocked out. If it can be lost, it's going to be lost. If people are not anchored in Jehovah, they're going to be knocked out. Understand something. People say there's going to be a great falling away. A man came to me one time. I believe it was Brother Stone said, Brother Jamie explained this to me. Scripture says in one place uh, there's going to be a great falling away. In another place uh, it says there's going to be a great revival in the end time. Uh, What do you think of that? Uh, I said, I think you can fall away if you want to and you can have revival uh, if you want to. If you can be shaken, you're going to be shaken. Uh, If the devil can take you out, uh, he's going to take you out. Uh, But he cannot take out anybody who's anchored uh, in the Lord. Uh, He can't take anyone out uh, who's occupying a prayer closet uh, and praying through daily. Uh, So understand it. It's going to happen. Uh, there's going to be people perish for lack of knowledge, uh, ever learning, but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Uh, but we got to know some things if we're going to be victorious in this Christian life. Uh, we must also know that these things cannot be compromised. Preachers have led themselves to believe that they can compromise certain principles. They believe that the end justifies the mean. That's a lie drawn right up out of hell. We can't afford to compromise. First thing we need to know, ultimately, victory in the things of God is by faith. That's what our whole series before this was, was on faith. There's many people who's going to say, we know that. We know that. There's more to this truth, though, than merely saying, I take it by faith. I take it by faith. We said that last week, it's more than just lip service. It's more than just speaking it. Every life of achievement in the Bible is labeled with a single phrase, by faith. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, we find Enoch, Moses, Abraham, Sarah. What does it say about them? They all walk by faith. They all walk by faith. That's the principle of the Bible that cannot be violated. Jesus put great emphasis on faith. He constantly told those that he healed, what did he say in Luke 7 and 50? Thy faith has saved thee. In Matthew 9 and 22, thy faith has made thee whole. Matthew 9 and 29, according to your faith is it unto you. Mark 9 and 23, if thou canst believe. The woman that with the issue of blood that we talked about earlier, when she touched him, he said, woman, thy faith has made thee whole in Matthew 9 and 22. To the man with the lunatic boy in Mark 9, 23, he said, If thou canst can believe. Notice it doesn't say the Lord hath made thee whole, but thy faith hath made thee whole. Now, we know that the Lord did make them whole. We know that. But the principle involved here for us uh, is knowing that it's your faith that secures the blessings of God. The principle cannot be violated. God is not going to heal you just because you look pitiful. He's not going to do it. He's not going to heal you because you have a need. The woman with the issue of blood looked pitiful. She had a need. Spent all she had. Didn't get better. She got worse. But that didn't heal her. She didn't receive her healing in that. But she said, if I can touch the healing of his garment, what did that mean? Jesus will heal me. But having a knowledge and knowing that was not enough. Her knowing that calls her to get to Jesus. When you know that Jesus is the healer, you find a way to get to Jesus. I'll go down seven times, a tree I'll even climb. I'll even tear the roof off just to get to you. Whatever it takes. When you know that, you're going to be like that that man. You're going to be like one of the friends of that man who ripped the roof off to lower him in. Because when you have friends and family that are sick, 
You're going to say, not let me get you to ER, not let me get you to the best doctor I know, but let me get you to Jesus. Let me get you to Jesus. And so they knew that. And here's the second principle that we've got to understand. It's your faith that's going to make us whole. But the second principle is not only must I know that God is almighty, but I must know that God is almighty in me. He's almighty God, but is he almighty in you? We're too many times looking for somebody that God is almighty in. When we have a need, we, don't, we, we know he's almighty God, but he can't be almighty in my life because I'm just a simple person and I'm this and I'm that. Well, go, get beyond that. We're, we're going and, and we're spending gas money and, and we're traveling here and there. Brother Scott, when he was here preaching a few months ago, remember him saying that? That preacher told him. He said it was a rebuke. He said, but it was true. That preacher said, you can't keep coming to my revivals and chasing me down across states every time you get into a bad circumstance. You've got to know that God, the same God that is almighty in me is almighty in you. There, there are going to be times you can't get to the preacher. There's going to be times that you can't get to mom and dad and grandma and grandpa. But understand something. We've got to know that he's almighty in me. The process breaks down here to understand everybody who believes there is a God believes he's almighty. When Jesus was on the earth, the devils recognized him. The devils would cry out, Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? The devil knew he was almighty. Every man who admits there's a God believes the almightiness of God. But you've got to go beyond that. You must know God is almighty almighty in you unless I know that God will do what he promised in his word uh, and that he will do it through me uh, I will waver uh, and in wavering I'm going to lose you can't sit around and wait for almighty God to rise up in somebody else oh I'm waiting for almighty God he's going to rise up in somebody else no he wants to rise up in you God wants to do great things in you and through you He's, he's already doing it through those who are yielded and surrendered. I can stand and testify to you of many times that the great I am, Almighty God, has rose up and did great things in and through my life. But the purpose is for you to have that same testimony and for you to grasp that, get, that, get a hold of that principle, and knowing I can't waver. Here's Moses, the controversy with God at the burning bush. God says to Moses, come now, therefore, and I will send you unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people. In Exodus 3 and 10, God did not say to Moses, go to Egypt and pray for me to deliver the people. But he said, you go and bring them out. Now, God's the deliverer. We know that. But we've got to also know that God is in me. God said to Moses, I have heard the cry of my people, and I'm sending you to deliver them. Moses here says, in effect, I can believe that you can do it, God, but not through me. I'm a man of slow speech. I'm this and I'm that. God says, I want to deliver them. I want to do it through you. He said, Jesus, Isaiah prophesied it. Jesus, the first message he preached, he picks up the Bible and he repeats it. Sits down after reading it. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel. And, and to do what? And to set captives free, to open the prison doors, uh, and to bring all of these wonderful things through the anointing. Uh, and you've got to understand something. He said, Moses, uh, you go and bring them out. God's telling you, go and bring them out. Go and do something for the kingdom of God. God's almightiest, uh, almightiness was not just in the point of the qu in, in that you can do it. It wasn't just in that question question that Moses was here was appropriation and obedience to faith. It was hanging in the balance here. Ultimately, Moses did go. And what did he do when he went? He delivered the people. Holy Ghost recorded that he did it how? By faith. By faith. He did what God told him to do. He came to the realization that the almightiness of God was in him. Oh, you got to come to that realization. You've got to come to that realization that Almighty God is working in and through you. He's filling us with the power to do many wonderful things. Now, many of you struggle in that area. Many have the problem, have a problem in our home, have a problem in the marriage, in our body, some difficulties going on. We've seen God work some things out in our lives. But we've run up against some things that seemingly just won't give up. Amen? I, I've seen God move in all of these areas, but then there's... Oh, 
Anybody ever had that? Anybody just banging up against that wall now? That circumstance, that hard place that we talked about Sunday morning, he's a rock in your hard place, by the way. And he is in you. And understand something, there's that struggle. And understand if we trace our weakness in the exercise of authority of faith to the source, we're going to find that our spiritual vitality is sapped through failure to take hold and grasp of this thought, Christ in you. Christ in you. I, I was praying one time many years ago, just, just battling. And I said, Lord, it's no use. It's no use. I thought I was being very theological and very spiritual, just a young Christian. And I thought I was telling God something. I said, God, I... I Seemed like, I think I heard somebody else say it or pray it. Say, just like my prayer, somebody testifying, one of them testicriers. Testif- you ever heard one of those? I just prayed and my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. I tried that one on God. I said, God, I can't get what I need to get because it seems like my prayers aren't going past the ceiling. And if God would have been standing there, I could picture him with a smile on his face and shaking his head saying, oh, I heard these words. Oh, but son, they don't have to get past the ceiling. I'm in you. I'm in you. I'm right beside you. I'm all around you. Your prayers don't have to break through the ceiling and through the clouds and through the atmosphere and go past the Milky Way to get to me. I'm right there with you. I said, oh, an epiphany, a breakthrough, to know that there he is, Christ in you. Now listen, nobody has to go to heaven and bring him down. He's not a billion miles away. He's in you. Understand something. In our search for God, we've got to come uh, to a place that we begin to realize uh, that we can find him in a real and a personal way uh, and understand that we're looking without for him, but he can only be found within. Uh, we, we can't go driving around looking for God. Not to go waste all your gas trying to find somewhere where God's at. I tried this church. God wasn't there. I tried that church. God's not there. He said, I'm with you. I'm in you. And when he's in you, it don't matter if you went to that church over there, over here, down there. When you showed up, God showed up. One of the greatest compliments I've ever received as a pastor, as a person, as a man told me one time, he said, Pastor, he said, uh, this was told to me twice. This old man, he was dying. He said, Pastor, every time you step in my house, it's just like Jesus walked in the room with you. Another man told me, he said, when you came to, when I went to, to Broken Bow, Oklahoma to try out for the church, he said, when you walked in the door and you walked down the aisle and you sat on that front pew, he said, it was almost like I could see that Christ was with you and just sat down there with you. That's the greatest compliment we can get. That's the greatest understanding that we can receive. I didn't go, no, 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 no. No, I said, yes, yes, yes. I can't even walk without him holding my hand. He's got to be with me. He's got to be in me. He's got to be working through. There's so much that gets in this mind. I've got to have Jesus. I've got to have the Holy Ghost in me, don't you? We're looking uh, without too many times when he's right there. He's in you. And if you won't, uh, you, you, if you won't uh, he'll be born in, you can be born in him. The power in this knowledge uh, is the inward union with Christ. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 16 and 17, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Can anything describe actual union more realistically than that? He that is joined to God is one. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. If I'm in the union with Christ, then he that comes against me has come against Christ. Oh, when you know that Christ is in you, Jesus said, it's not that they hate you. They, he hates me. He's hated me from the beginning. So if you're full of Christ, understand something, that's a good thing, but also know there's a big bullseye on you. Devil's coming, but you don't have to fear because greater is he that is out there somewhere and I've got to go find him. No, greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. Who's in you? Who's in you? If it's a second personality, they call that, they give us all kinds of 
medical names, but it's called demon possession is what it's called. But there's only one that dwells with us, that fights all of our battles, Christ in me, full of glory. And I understand that nothing, there's, there's so much that can overcome me. There's so much that can get to me and get me aggravated and get me frustrated. I had a few of those today, but there's nothing that can get to Christ. There's nothing that can get to Christ. So I stand with my loins girt about with truth. Pilate said this, what is truth? Jesus said, I am. Understand something, that gives me the ability to stand and not waver in the face of the seemingly impossible. When locked into situations that look hopeless, stand with unwavering spirit of faith. Stand with your loins girt about with truth, knowing that he stands with you, he is in you. It is that that gives us the ability to stand. In closing tonight, we've got to come to know in a bold way and declare Christ in me means all the power of Christ is in me. He said, all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. He said, I've turned it around and gave it back to you, church. We're not some anemic, run-down, beat-down people. Too many times we, we walk around like we've already lost, like we're defeated, like we're the underdogs. No, the victory was won at Calvary. And it's up to us just to go ahead and let them know, I'm on the victor side. And so we have to realize that, that Christ is in me, and that's absolutely essential for us to recognize where Christ was when he made the statement. The power was not given to him as God, but the power was given to him as the man, Christ Jesus. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth, Matthew 28, 18. He was crucified, buried, and he rose. And he presented himself before the Father and was accepted as the firstborn of a new race. The power was not given to him as God. It was given to him as the man, Christ Jesus, which means it was given to the church as his body. You are the body of Christ, members in particular, that understand that we're armed with the truth. That We come to almost unconscious abiding in Christ whose resources become more real to us than visible. We don't have to wring our hands and, and worry about, what should I do? Where should I turn? Paul said in Galatians, it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me and lives through me. He wants to lead you in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. How about handing him the reins? Somebody said, Jesus is my co-pilot. You're in trouble. He needs to be the pilot. He needs to be the pilot. And let him take full control. Does he have full control of you and your life tonight? Do you have that unwavering testimony, that unwavering spirit of prayer? If not, these altars are a fine place to get it. Maybe tonight you need to bring something Cast your care upon him. I want to give you that opportunity to do that tonight as you stand with me. I want us to spend some time in prayer. So maybe you say, Pastor, all's good. Well, not all's good for people in Oregon and California right now. Not all's good for lost loved ones, people that are sick as they've never been before with COVID-19. So let's spend a season in prayer. Pray one for another. Pray for our upcoming camp meeting. And pray that we can have this unwavering power, this almighty working of God in us. Because God wants to use you to reach somebody. Maybe tonight. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe the next day. But always be ready to give an answer for that hope that lies within you. Father, as we approach this altar tonight, we realize that you're the great I am. And that you're the great I am in us and through us. And I pray Christ in me would rise up. Holy Ghost power in me would rise up. You said you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you to be witness of me. Father, God, I pray that if anybody here tonight not filled with the Holy Ghost, you fill them with the Holy Ghost. Fill them with that power. Fill them with that anointing. Meet with us around these altars tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we just close out this service tonight around the altars? Just find you somewhere to pray, whether it's right there in your pew, 
up here in these altars. Let's just seek the Lord.